Don't whine and pine away. Rise and shine today. Don't die in the wilderness. Pat in Love with Pat's Two Cents. We're God's Church of Love online. We're going to read from Isaiah 44. For those of you who don't really get who God is in your life, <clears throat> let me share this with you. God is faithful. God is not a man that he should lie. He's not deadbeat. He doesn't have step. And he's not shucking and jiving. He means what he says. He's true. He's faithful. And as you get to know him, you'll realize that the longer you live, the more you'll see he proves himself to us. Listen to this. <clears throat> this is Isaiah chapter 44. And we are reading from verse 24 to 26. Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself, that frustrateth the tokens of liars and maketh diviners mad, that turneth wise men backwards and maketh their knowledge foolish, that confirmeth the word of his servant and performeth the counsel of his messengers, that saith to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be inhabited, and to the cities of Judah ye shall be built, and I will raise up the decayed places. Wow. Listen. When God says anything, you can take that to the bank. That check will never bounce. God means what he says, says what he means. He even says out of his own mouth, I require truth on the inward part. Let me read verse 3 to verse 8. I want you to hear this. <clears throat> Same chapter. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry Round. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. And they shall spring up as among the grass as willows by the watercourses. One shall say, I am the Lord's. And another shall call himself by the name of Jacob. And another shall subscribe with his hand unto the Lord. And surname himself by the name of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, I am the last, and beside me there is no God. And who, as I shall call, and shall declare it, and set an order for me, since I appointed the ancient people, and the things that are coming, and shall come, let them show unto them. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time and have declared it, ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. Now listen, let me say this real quick. Excuse my voice. I'm still getting over. I'm healed from the cold, but my voice is always the last thing to catch up. It, it takes a while to get the message, to get the memo. So um, I'm quite hoarse. Forgive that. But uh, I'm trying to be as, as clear and articulate as possible so you can understand what I'm saying. Okay. Isaiah 36. Let's see. I want to make sure I'm getting this right. Let's go to Isaiah 55. We're still in Isaiah. Let's just stay there for a minute. I got a lot of double numbers today. It was really bizarre. But anyway, Isaiah 55. Okay. Hmm. Now, check this out. Starting at verse 1. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, 
Come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread? And you labor for that which satisfieth not. Hearken diligently unto me and eat ye that which is good. And let your soul delight itself in fatness. Mm. Mm -mm. Incline your ear and come unto me here, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Listen, you guys. God is telling you, you can take whatever he promises you to the bank. Whatever he says. He is for his people. Life, the enemy, people around us, circumstances, challenges, trials, problems, setbacks, losses, enemies, whatever the case may be. God is always for you. <clears throat> he says in Jeremiah 29, 11, I believe, I know the plans I have for you, plans to bless you and not harm you, Plans to give you a hope in the future. My question to you is, why are you looking at God so cockeyed? What has he done to you? When was the last time God ripped you off and stole money out your wallet? When was the last time God put you out in public and humiliated you? Hmm? When was the last time God stole the keys to your car and drove it and had a wreck? And the car's totaled. Think about that. When was the last time God jammed you up in public and made fun of you, put you down, made you feel like a nobody? Yeah, when was the last time God lied to you, promised you and didn't come through? See, we don't realize the advocate we have in God. We don't realize how for us God really is. God is for you, not against you. Listen, let's go to Job chapter 5. I know it's a lot of word today, but y'all get over it. It, it ain't, it ain't going to hurt you. Job chapter 5. <clears throat> Boy. All right. Hmm. Starting at verse 6. Although affliction cometh not forth of the dust, neither doth trouble spring out of the ground, yet man is born unto trouble. As the sparks fly upward, I would seek unto God, and unto God would I commit my cause, which doeth great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number, who giveth rain upon the earth and sendeth water upon the fields to set up on high those that be low, that those which mourn may be exalted to safety. Hmm. He disappointed the devices of the crafty so that their hands cannot perform their enterprise. We are protected, you guys. Okay, back to the word. He taketh the wise in their own craftiness and the counsel of the froward is carried headlong. They're tossed, thrown to the curb. They meet with darkness in the, day, in the daytime and grope in the noonday as in the night. But he saveth the poor from the sword, from their mouth, and from the hand of the mighty. So the poor hath hope, and iniquity stoppeth her mouth. Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. Therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. For he maketh sore, and bindeth up. He woundeth, and his hands make whole. He shall deliver thee in six troubles, yea, in seven 
there shall no evil touch thee. In famine, he shall redeem thee from death. And in war, from the power of the sword. Thou shalt be hid from the scourge of the tongue. Neither shalt thou be afraid of destruction when it cometh. At destruction and famine, thou shalt laugh. Neither shalt thou be afraid of the beast of the earth. For thou shalt be in league with the stones of the field, and the beast of the field shall be at peace with thee. And thou shalt know that thy tabernacle shall be in peace. And thou shalt visit thy habitation, and shalt not sin. Thou shalt know also that thy seed shall be great in thine offspring, as the grass of the earth. Thou shalt come to thy grave in a full age, like a shock of corn cometh in his season. Lo, this we have searched it, so it is. Hear it, and know that it for thy good. God is there for your good. He will provide. He will heal. He will protect. He will guide you with his eye. He will dispatch angels round about you to keep you in all your ways, lest you dash your foot against a stone. That's what Psalms 91 says. There shall no evil befall thee. Neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. That's Psalms 91 too. Listen, you have no idea what you have, what you have going for you. You know, when I look at my life, I'm not the smartest person. And there are areas in my life that in my mind, I could actually be the biggest dummy. I call myself dum diddy dum dum. It's a joke. You know, don't y'all get bent out of shape. But there are a lot of things in life. The longer you live, the more you realize what you don't know. The more you realize what you don't understand. Now, there's a scripture where God says, my ways are above your ways and my thoughts above your thoughts. Listen, we don't fathom what he's doing. We don't understand why it had to rain as hard as it rained when I got a leaky roof. We don't understand why it rained while I was out without an umbrella. Why didn't God tell me to get an umbrella? <clears throat> okay. Guess what? That's what he gave you a brain for. That's what he gave you common sense for. There are many things. I remember one time I started realizing God was giving me little signals, little signals about things that other people would think God doesn't have time for. I put something on the counter, walk away from it. I felt uneasy about it. Sure enough, bam, crash. I got a mess to clean up. Make me late. Jack up my whole day. Now I'm in a bad mood. Dag nabbit. Well, guess what? God was the first one to let me know, don't put it there. Put it in a better place. That's, that's a precarious position. That's an accident waiting to happen. Feeling it. I'm feeling this. One time I left my house. I felt an accident trying to happen to me all day long. Had three close calls, almost hit a guy with a bike, almost ran off the curb. I mean, just all these accidents that just barely did not happen. And I'm feeling that there's an assignment against me. I'm feeling like a target. I'm not afraid when I drive. I'm very aggressive. I have no problems driving. I'm very confident on the road. But I tell you, that day I knew there was a spiritual attack. And what did I do? Grandma kept going out anyway. God pulls up to the stop sign and out of the blue, he's stopping now. I got the right of way. I see him slow down almost to a stop. I proceed and bam, he speeds up, foot on the accelerator and totals my car the day before I was getting the insurance on it. Yeah. 
I was angry with the Lord for three years. No, take that back. I was angry with the Lord for five years. Five years. I mean, I walked with him, I talked with him, I loved him, but I wasn't happy about the way he handled that. Uh -huh. Let me repeat that. I wasn't happy about the way he handled that. Mm -hmm. Because, see, before I backed out of my driveway, I bound, I rebuked, I cast out, I canceled the assignment of the enemy, I went through all the spiritual warfare and all the religious mumbo jumbo, taking authority, taking spiritual authority, hallelujah, God's got me covered. Hmm. So I presumed to believe. You know what God's covering was on me? The feeling I had all day. It took five years of telling that story, saying the only thing in my life I could not understand why God allowed to happen to me. Now, number one, remember this. The ambulance didn't have to come. Glass flew everywhere. I wasn't hurt. I had a little bruise on my side. That's it. The guy in the car I was given a ride home to for doing all that work at our house. He was he was fine. No problem with him. No whiplash. No broken bones. No eyes poked out. We were both in perfect condition. But the car was totaled. So God answered my prayer, Lord, protect us. Ha! Yeah. But I could not, I told that story of all the things in my life, walking with the Lord. I always wondered why would God allow that to happen to me? As the violins played in the background. Ooh, 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 ooh. <gasps> so what happened? One day I told that story for the umpteenth time, five years down the road. Mm -hmm. And as I'm telling it, the Holy Spirit starts chatting with me. I got an instant powwow going on. And I had to go to the restroom because it was an instant download. And it would have taken five minutes to explain. But the download was a split second with the revelation following. And I couldn't believe what I got. Check this out, y'all. All that time, I couldn't understand why God would allow the car to be total. He knew I needed transportation. We prayed. Why did not God answer my prayer? Mm -hmm. That one really boggled the mind. And I, I'm acting melodramatic for a reason, y'all. So go with me on this, okay? You know, I'm, I'm hammy. Okay, so I'm sitting up here going through the woe is me syndrome. Never could figure out why God would allow that to happen to me. Well, yeah, I went to the restroom because it was coming and I could feel the emotion well enough. And I told my, my customer, I'll be right back. I go in the restroom and the Lord's like, remember when you almost hit that bicycle? The guy on the bicycle? That was me. That was me warning you. Remember that nasty feeling you had all day? That was me warning you. Yes, there's an assignment against you for an accident. Remember that accident you almost had in the intersection? That close call? That was me warning you. Remember when you almost backed off of the curb or backed whatever I backed into what you almost hit and you stopped just in the nick of time. That was me wanting you. I did everything to convince you to park that car in your driveway. But you kept presuming that I had you covered. 
My covering was my warning. You came out of the ark of safety by not heeding the warning. God did not get on my case. God did not fuss at me. I'm saying it dramatically because that's how it impacted me. But the way God said it was, remember when you bought the hamburger and that happened? Remember when that happened? Remember when that happened? That was me. I did everything I could. You did not heed the warning. He didn't get on my case. He didn't condemn me. He didn't fuss at me. He just finally decided, let me set the record straight here. Girlfriend still ain't got the message, so I have to teach her. I have to break it down. Like Jesus had to break down the parables to the disciples when they were spiritually dull in their spirits. God had to break that baby down to me. And he let me know this was not my doing. This was not my not answering your prayer. I answered your prayer. Neither you nor your passenger got hurt. I answered your prayer. But you did not answer my warning. Now, there are a lot of things we do in life. There are a lot of things that happen in life. Some of you, you have a child that died. They got run over by a car. You're mad at God. I'm telling you, this whole thing came to me. And you are so mad at God for letting your child die. How could God not warn your child, not warn you, not stop the driver? Well, guess what? He gives us freedom, free will. And what probably happened, nine times out of ten, this happens a lot. People die out of disobedience. Not everybody. Either the person dies out of disobeying the parent and going outside the gate, or the driver disobeyed God and was driving drunk. Consequences occur from those type of things. And then life happens. And unfortunately, one of your loved ones gets in the way of life. It's not God doing it, y'all. This is people. It's sin. Sin, baby. The curse of this earth. Not God. Listen, let me tell this story so you get what I'm talking about. Three children. I'm feeling really stirred as I'm telling this story, so somebody needs to hear this. Three children, listen, were with their father. Mother passed away. Three children, two boys, one girl. The two boys were like nine and seven years old. The girl was like four. Father had to go drive to the market real quick. He was just going to make a quick run and come right back. Now, who knows if God stirred him, made it occur to him, maybe I should take my kids with me on this trip. You don't know, do you? Right. We don't get all that because people don't tell all. But... He instructs his children not to leave the yard. Do not go outside the gate. Stay inside the yard. I will be less than a half an hour. Stay inside the yard. I'm just throwing the time thing out there. I don't know how long he was. But he was trying to make a quick run. The two boys, the girl obeyed. Until the two boys twist her arm behind her, basically, in essence. And they persuade her because they have to take her with them. They can't stay at home. They want to go out and play. That's what kids like to do. Not bad kids, not naughty kids, not rebellious kids, but disobedient. And there are times when you come out of the ark of safety and you put yourself in danger's way through acts of disobedience like I did when I kept driving my car after getting all those warnings to stay put. Hmm. So this, these kids, here they are, 
They want to go swimming in the riverbank. The boys are good swimmers. The girl, she's too young. So what do they do? And the very th that was one of the things he said too, stay away from the riverbank. They go to the riverbank. And she's saying, no, daddy said we can. And so you better shut up. If you tell, we're never going to talk to you again. You know how big brothers will bully a little sister. Well, that, they went through all that with her until she finally conceded and went with them. They get to the riverbank. Big brother jumps in. Oh, he's swimming. Ah, oh, this is fun. Having the ball. Next thing, the current gets too strong. Uh-oh. Whoops. He's sweat. Little brother, he's got to jump in and save his big brother. He's a good swimmer, too. So he jumps in. Uh-oh. Both of them. We got a problem. We got a situation. Where's God in this? What is God doing while these two boys are drowning? Oh, no. How could God allow it? What? All right. Little baby sister was told, you better not tell. So now she's so scared. Time is of the essence. You can only go without oxygen four minutes before there's brain damage, y'all. Now, we don't know how long this took, but Pops comes in, and he's wondering where the kids are, and he sees the little girl walking around the house acting all weird. And he's like, what's going on? He finally shakes it out of us. She tells, she tells all. And in panic, he takes his truck and drives as close to the riverbed as he can get. And he looks and he sees two bodies crammed up against the rocks on the side, I guess against the brook, whatever. He gets down there and it's too late. He meets the fate of his two sons. Two dead bodies lying there, limp, blue, whatever color they were for lack of oxygen. Too late. No matter what he did, it was too late. They weren't bad kids. Can you imagine the father saying, where was God when my sons jumped in? Well, you told the sons not to jump in. That was God's protection. They jumped out of the ark of safety when they disobeyed what you told them not to do. Listen, you guys, we have to understand. God gave us free will. Now there are times when life just happens. But trust me, God will help you. If, if God will give you instruction, some of you wonder why you're bogged down with high blood pressure. Some of you, you wonder why you got stuck on a dialysis machine. You wonder why you're stuck with cancer, whatever the case may be. The Bible says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. You see, it tells you to get knowledge. Get knowledge. Don't live a life of ignorance. Don't walk around with your head up in the clouds whistling Dixie. You got to teach yourself how to keep yourself as well as possible. You have to educate yourself. You never stop trying to learn about how to make the quality of your life better. You find out something has got an issue and it causes problems in, in the body, you start to stay away from that. You wean yourself off of it. You might like it. It might taste good. Hey, some things you can do without, but some things people choose not to do without. My husband said all the time, he said, I'm, I can't blame anybody for going blind. I can't blame anybody but myself. I was the one doing all that drinking. I was the one that brought the diabetes onto myself. I was the one that ate with abandon. I can't blame anybody for being in the shape I'm in but myself. God is good. Even if I didn't have good judgment, God is good. And because of his right attitude, God brought him through as smoothly, even though he had to go through those bumps in the road. 
even though he had to pay some consequences, he kept worshiping and praising God. And God blessed his latter end. He said, he said this was the best, the relationship we had, the life we had. God had blessed him, it just blessed his socks off. In spite of the blindness, in spite of the dialysis, Milton recognized he was a blessed man. Blessed and highly favored. He knew it. One night, we were laying in the bed. And the spirit of prophecy came on me like, like crazy. And I said, Milton, I got a word for you. And the tears started coming. And I saw this train way off at a distance coming. And Milton is blind, right? Getting ready to get on dialysis. Son getting ready to go into prison. All kind of stuff going wrong in his life. But God shows me this train coming way from the distance, turning a corner. And I said, Milton, God's telling me to tell you your train is coming in. And we, we lived there for another seven years, eight years. No, we lived there for another. We were in that apartment, in his apartment for about three years. And then we moved to my house. We were in my house for about two years. I mean, uh, 10 years. 13 years later, we get this house. His train finally came in. See, God has blessings set up for you. Milton got cheated out of his inheritance. What he did was he begged God to help him forgive. Just forgive and let it go. You know, it's how you react to life and its setbacks and the wrongs done to you. That determine your altitude or the lack thereof. You can scrape the bottom of the barrel for the rest of your life if you choose to. Because some people choose to live in their attitude rather than live by faith. They choose to live by sight and emotion rather than live by faith and praise. How will you live your life? How will you choose to handle the challenges in your marriage? Will you ask God for more understanding or will you blame the spouse for everything going wrong? How miserable your life is, how much better it would have been if you had married so-and-so. What's his face or what's her face? Would have been better. Your grass is always green on the other side. Baby, you can make your own grass a whole lot greener if you get God all in the mix and praise him while you're doing it. Thank him while you're doing it. Lean on him while you're doing it. Trust him while you're doing it. God is not your enemy. When I ended up in ICU, I could have laid there like a lot of patients I prayed for in the hospital. When I do chaplain duty, you should hear the complaints. The food is lousy. The service is lousy. The rooms are lousy. The beds are lousy. Everything is rotten and, and low down and messed up. Right. And you can imagine how many trips they have to make back to that same hospital. After four trips in two months, never having been in a hospital before, I was determined not to complain. I joked, but I would not complain. I made a point of letting the people that worked over me know how much I appreciated their efforts. They may not have done a perfect job, but they tried. And I knew God had me. God had me. I wasn't trusting in man. I was trusting myself in God's hands through the staff. 
God is where my focus was. Now, I could sit up there and say, God, how could you let me lay up in here in, in ICU? How could you let that happen to me? Why did you let my heart do this? Why did you let that fail? Why did you let that go? So you saw me trying to do my, my body good. You saw me trying to do good by drinking all that water, by putting down all those fluids. But you saw me changing my diet. How could you let that happen to me? Guess what? Consequences happen even through the best of intentions, babe. My people perish for lack of knowledge. I didn't know I was drowning myself. I didn't know I was doing more harm than good. In spite of my mess ups, in spite of my lack of knowledge, my ignorance, in spite of the harm I was inadvertently doing to my own body, God still kept me, didn't he? He took me through that, pulled me out on the other end and began the healing process and began teaching me a whole new level of knowledge about my own body. Even gave me what kind of foods to eat so that I could hasten the healing process. See, when we focus on the problem rather than the solution, and our solution is God, always y'all, the problem grows big. We lose hope. We lose faith. We get discouraged. Then we complain. We get an attitude. And many of you have walked away from God right in the thick of it when you could have experienced some beautiful revelations, you could have experienced some things from God that you never would have known. God waiting with bated breath to show you some things, but you, you don't want to look because you're mad. I'm telling you, you guys, God is for us in every way, shape, and form. If he allows you to be attacked by the devil, there's a reason. There's a reason. <laughs> ah. If he allows you to experience sleep paralysis, if you, if you ask and you acknowledge him in all your ways, he will direct your path. He'll open your eyes. He'll teach you some stuff. Do you have an ear to hear? Huh? A mind to pay attention, a heart to understand. Do you have it? Or would you rather just get an attitude? How could God allow? How could God allow me to be an ICU? How could God allow my husband to die? Trust me, baby, every one of us has to die. Just comes with the package called life. And that's death. Nobody escapes it, baby. A chosen few that God translated straight to heaven. I keep asking them, Lord, would you do that for me? But guess what? We all got to go through that door one way or another. This journey comes to an end. So when people in your family die, don't you cock your eyes up at God and shake your fist like you <laughs> don't even go there. That's part of life, baby. Some people, it's a relief for them. While you trying to hang on and make them hang on and keep them on on an indefinite life support. And they're begging you to let them go because you're torturing them. You're prolonging their suffering. But God knows death is a release for a lot of people. Do you trust in God knowing what he's doing? Do you? I pray you do. If you're not sure what's going on with him, ask him. Read his word. Get an understanding of how his heart works. 
Read how Jesus lived. Go in the Old Testament and read all the mercies that God showed. Get to know his heart. Okay. <clears throat> Pray. Ask God to open your eyes and give you understanding. Read Proverbs for wisdom and understanding. Everything you need is right there. It's in God. And God shows us a lot of things in life through his word. What are you focused on, y'all? Who's got your attention? The problems or the solution? Mm. I pray you shift your focus so you can get in and out of these trials so much quicker. And you can find out just how much God loves you, how much he's on your side, how he's pulling for you. And then one day, you will be able to do what the word says. You laugh at your enemy, at calamity you laugh, at problems you laugh, at war you laugh, at threats you laugh. Why? Because you know who's on your side. That's right. If God be for you, who can be against you? Ah, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. There's not one commandment. There's not one requirement. God requires of you that he is not willing and able to give you the ability to do. When you can't forgive, he's got the ability. When you can't love, he's got all the love you need. When you're in turmoil, he's got your peace. When you feel like you're just existing, he is your life. He's got everything you need. Come to the water. Come eat. Come buy without money. Ask. Come to the source. God bless you. I got to stop. God bless you. Be encouraged. God is truly for you. More than you'll ever know.